What is going on, everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back to review the first two episodes of Masters of the Air, which dropped today on Apple TV+. Plus. I'll go spoiler-free initially, but there are a few details that I'm going to want to discuss later in the video. But long story short, this show is well worth checking out. Can it measure up to the shows that it's inevitably going to be compared to a show like Band of Brothers? Well, that remains to be seen. We're only two episodes in, but... If you're obsessed with shows and movies about World War II, well, then you probably don't even need a review. You're probably way ahead of me, and I've already watched these first two episodes. But here are the vital stats related to the show as written on Wikipedia. Masters of the Air is an upcoming, or now here, American war drama streaming television miniseries created by John Sheban and John Orloff and developed by Orloff for Apple TV+. Plus. It is based on the 2007 book Masters of the Air, America's bomber boys who fought the air war against Nazi Germany by Donald L. Miller and follows the actions of the 100th Bomb Group, a B-17 Flying Fortress unit in the 8th Air Force during World War II. The unit was nicknamed the Bloody 100th due to the heavy losses it incurred in combat missions. The series serves as a companion to Band of Brothers 2001 and the Pacific 2010. And I must admit... I've never seen The Pacific, and that's a huge oversight on my part. I've seen Band of Brothers twice, but that is not, I guess, overdoing it with Band of Brothers does not make up for the fact that I've not seen The Pacific. But I saw that it's now available on Netflix, so I'll be checking that out as well. And I don't want to sound unnecessarily morbid or bloodthirsty by suggesting that two episodes of Masters of the Air have kind of whetted my appetite to watch yet another World War II show. However... Executive producer Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks, they clearly know what they're doing on this front. And I just find it incredibly admirable that Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks would devote so much of their time and energy from their careers on this topic. Because you would think, oh, we made Saving Private Ryan. We're, we're finished. We can move on. But they're like, no, no, no. We want to do Band of Brothers. And we also want to do The Pacific. And we also want to do Masters of the Air. I mean, they, they just keep coming back to this subject and they could basically do anything they want with their career. Clearly, these are major passion projects for them. But I do worry that a show as good as this will kind of go criminally unseen on Apple TV+. Plus. I think Apple TV+, Plus still has a long way to go as a, a viable platform. But I have to say, I continue to be impressed by the caliber of filmmakers that Apple chooses to work with. we got uh, Argyle right around the corner. But for the first four episodes of this show, we have Kerry Fukunaga back in the director's chair. And while I wasn't necessarily the biggest fan of his James Bond movie, No Time to Die, however, he directed every single episode of season one of True Detective, one of the best shows of the last 10 years. And I just feel like premium prestige TV seems to be the place where Kerry Fukunaga truly belongs. He is absolutely firing on all cylinders again with the show that it looks and feels like a huge epic feature film like Saving Private Ryan or any World War II film that you care to mention. I actually might even argue that it looks better and has better production value than a lot of uh, classic World War II movies. I couldn't believe just how gorgeous and terrifying the show was all at once because you have all these majestic epic shots of all these bombers flying in formation you're like wow like just so awe-inspiring what they were able to achieve and then the combat begins and this show pulls absolutely no punches because these planes when they're flying in the air running on their bombing missions they get like whole shot through them like goddamn swiss cheese and when the uh when the pilots and the gunners are hit by German flak, it is just absolutely fucking horrific. And even if I have a few nitpicky grievances about some sequences where it feels like the actors were given a little bit too much rope with which to hang themselves when it comes to like hanging out and drinking and laughing and singing where like when actors are clearly improvising, unless the actor is one of the greatest actors who's ever lived, it can come across as a little like inauthentic or kind of off-putting. But these are very, very minor, minor quibbles on my part. I was totally invested in these episodes and it helps that Austin Butler and Calum Turner were cast as the leads. And so far, they've really impressed me. Like their friendship, Buck and Bucky, they, it just seems so genuine and so sincere. And they're also really selling me on the idea of these being young men who are expected to fly deadly missions on a regular basis where like, you know, a huge percentage of those planes are not coming back. They're going to get shot down. They're going to get captured. Or they're going to get killed. And I think if you wanted to make a case for an area where the show's really excelling, it's with all the little technical details before and after and during missions. Like, um, how can I say this? They're like these little montage sequences where they're just firing on off all this uh, technical jargon, which none of which really makes any sense to me, but it almost has like a musical quality with like the rapid fire editing and as they're firing off all their different commands and as they're going through their, their checklist and that sort of thing. And then once they're in the air, it's, 
uh, you know, high level problem solving with life or death consequences where trying to keep the guy next to you alive becomes the most important thing. Or if you're flying in formation and one of those planes is a problem with one of their engines and they can't keep up, like, do you leave them behind to get picked off by Germans or do you slow the entire squadron down and try and protect one plane on the way home? Because this show does a great job of explaining how when you have a B-17 flying fortress, what they're trying to create is what they call a combat box where you're flying in tight formation where all the different planes and the B-17s and whatnot, they're all kind of protecting each other because if you're by yourself, it's very easy to get picked off. But if you're flying as a tight unit, like in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, well, that makes y'all easier to hit. But when it comes to incoming German flyers, well, then it's very advantageous. And I think what's impressed me most about the show so far is this incredible feeling of suspense and dread when the German flak stops. Because like when these planes are flying into occupied territory, I mean, the, the sky is just ablaze with the German flak. But when the flak stops, it's about to get even worse because you know that there are flyers coming any minute. And it's just amazing how well Kerry Fukunaga stages these scenes, how well he shoots these scenes, because he's not pulling the camera back and like letting you watch these like majestic dogfights and that sort of thing. He puts you right in the seat of a pilot or a gunner or whatever the case might be as they're dealing with you know, fucking frostbite, because oftentimes it's like 50 below in the planes. Like if you have any holes in the plane and you're flying at 25,000 feet, well, yeah, it's going to get real fucking cold real soon. And so even like trying to grab your gun, like like your hands can freeze. And anyway, all those little details really help flesh out the experience and help put you in the, sh in the shoes of these soldiers. Like the idea of being served a huge breakfast of bacon and eggs and French toast on any day where you have a mission because it might be your last supper. And it's like, all right, well, shit. I was kind of hoping that I'd get something better than just like bacon and eggs and French toast, but it's better than what they're accustomed to. Or other little details like a navigator who gets so airsick that he can't do his job properly and his plane ends up nearly flying into occupied France as opposed to back to England. But every step of the way, I just couldn't believe it. I was like, I am watching TV, not a $300 million epic feature film. They have held absolutely nothing back with this show, but all that production value and all that sweep and all that technical detail wouldn't mean anything if the show didn't have the heart and the soul. And so that leads me back to <clears throat> Austin Butler and Calum Turner, who really are holding this show together. And of course, because I'm a giant Dune freak, I keep thinking, will the success of this show or the quality of the show, whether or not it's successful remains to be seen, but will the quality of this show indirectly help Dune Part 2 where Austin Butler is playing Fade Rautha. I would like to believe that he's doing such a good job on the show that his fame is going to skyrocket even more so and that it will indirectly lead to more eyeballs on Dune Part 2. But goddamn, Austin Butler, he's come a long way since uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood where he's like, I'm as real as a donut. I mean, he was incredible as Tex in that, but here we are five years later and he is on the cusp of becoming a full-blown superstar. So chalk that up as another actor discovered by Quentin Tarantino. But you can see that his confidence as an actor continues to grow where he's just so cool and so calm and collected. He's got that easy go and draw. And I feel like when you're trying to land a plane and there's some heavy crosswind, he, he's the master of understatement. Like, oh, it looks like we got a little breeze. And everybody else is freaking like, oh, my God, we're going to crash. But he's just Mr. No Big Deal. And I feel like you kind of have to have that attitude if you're going to survive just the stress and the anxiety of what they do on a daily basis, but Caleb Turner, he's really good as well. I guess he's running the risk of being typecast as uh, one of those actors who only does kind of old-fashioned patriotic dramas because he just appeared in The Boys in the Boat, and he was really good in that, the uh, George Clooney film, and that movie has been overperforming relative to expectations, so I guess there, there are worse fates than to be the guy where if you're making a movie about like, you know, rowing against the Nazis in the 1936 Olympics or fighting against the Nazis in 1943, Calum Turner is your guy. And I love how the show wasted absolutely no time. And I guess I'm starting to venture into spoiler territory, so if you don't want any details, bail out now. But the, the show opens with Buck and Bucky dancing with their girls and basically telling the story about how they came to be known as Buck and Bucky. And I won't uh, recount the story here because it's much better delivered by Calum Turner and uh, Austin Butler. But then we immediately flash forward to 1943, a few years later, where these guys are flying on missions, and the missions are just so goddamn brutal. I mean, it's, you almost can't even take the anxiety at times, but at the same time, it's also incredibly inspiring. I'm getting a little bit of chills just remembering, like, 
it's easy to talk about heroism and self-sacrifice and patriotism when you're hanging out at the bar, slinging back drinks, singing songs, all that stuff. It's another thing when the guy beside you no longer has a face because you know, you're just getting absolutely ripped to pieces. And just seeing how demoralizing a mission can get when you've got all these bombers flying into occupied territory and you're getting torn apart and a lot of these pilots are not coming home. But do you do something like poor visibility or too much cloud cover? You don't even get to drop your bombs. Like you have to ditch your bombs in the English Channel on the way home. So it's like, oh my God, like we lost all those planes. We lost all those guys. And we didn't even get to attempt to complete the mission nor even go to the secondary target. It's just, uh, it's incredibly emotionally powerful. And I'm probably guilty of getting a little overly emotional about World War II movies or World War II shows because my grandfather, Spotswood Hall, fought in World War II as a mortar man in uh, Western Europe. And he would be, would be, it was very hard to get any details out of him about combat. He would talk about things like getting trench foot from like sleeping in a fucking like hole all winter when it's cold and wet. And he would talk about things like, you know, getting in fights with people over like, you know, who's got more more cigarettes or little details like that. But he would very rarely talk about anything combat related unless it was like like just the inconvenience of like sitting in a trench. It's like tree burst that's exploding all around you due to German artillery. But when he would talk about World War II shows and movies that he was impressed by, usually it was a movie like The Best Years of Our Lives, the uh, the William Wyler film from 1946, which was exclusively about what it was like coming home for the veterans as opposed to their combat experiences. And so that was one of the only times he was willing to talk, kind of talk about World War II in the context of film and television. But I have to admit, I'm a junkie for this stuff. And while a lot of the World War II movies I've seen are more like World War II adventure movies, movies like The Great Escape or Where Eagles Dare, Kelly's Heroes. Uh, I guess A Bridge Too Far is much more serious and that's much more grim. But in the 50s and 60s and early 70s, World War II adventure movies were extremely popular. But it's tough to beat a show like uh, Band of Brothers. Once again, Band of Brothers is the standard by which this show is going to be judged. And so far, I think it's measuring up very well. But Band of Brothers is the gold standard. Whether or not this show can be the gold standard remains to be seen because I think we have seven more episodes to go. It's going to uh, run through, I think, March 15th. And the final episode is directed by Tim Van Patten, a uh, a serious uh, HBO veteran. But getting back to the show, I don't want to get too sad and weepy. I do want to exercise my critical thinking skills. So where are the flaws in this show? Uh, Barry Keoghan, a.k.a. Barry Keon or Barry Keegan, however you choose to pronounce it, even he's a little dodgy on the pronunciation of his last name in terms of like the correct pronunciation versus what he actually says. But they have him doing an American accent in the show, and it's a little, it's a little, I guess, uh, I wouldn't say gimmicky, but he's doing like a New York kind of tough guy accent, which, you know, we have a lot of, you know, people of Irish descent in New York. And so as an Irishman playing a New Yorker of Irish descent, it kind of works, but it's a little hammy. It's a little over the top. And I think he's one of the most talented actors of his generation. But I'm like, couldn't you just let him speak with an Irish accent? I know Ireland sat out World War II, but um, you, know, you could have said, oh, I'm from Ireland, but I moved to Scotland. And anyway, they, they could have come up with a better explanation, but... That would be one of my criticisms. And my other criticism would be sometimes when the actors are trying too hard to appear like you know, like they're like like when they're bonding or they're singing or telling stories, it comes across as a little mannered or like an affectation where they're trying too hard to have like period accurate dialogue. Like at one point, Caleb Turner, they're listening to a band playing, he says, I gotta sing, I gotta sing, and he gets up there and starts singing along with the song. And obviously, if Kalen Turner were singing a song from present day, he'd probably probably be much more convincing. But if you don't have a history of singing songs from the early 40s, it can come across as incredibly hollow and inauthentic. But once again, these are little details that I found like kind of off-putting, but they by no means diminish the overall power of the show. Because even if I don't like some of those scenes, what I really love are just seeing that easygoing, kind of calm, authentic, like love story between two men. Like these are these are buds. This is like a buddy movie in a lot of ways, or a buddy show in a lot of ways, where there's incredible mutual respect, but it's not like they spend all day talking about their feelings for each other. They just do everything together, and they rely rely upon each other's expertise and their skill. And these are two guys who have, who have both survived terrifying situations, and we're at the beginning of the story. We're, we're nowhere near the end. So I have no idea if both of them make it to the end, I have no idea what kind of harrowing, harrowing experiences they're going to endure. 
but I think that's the most important part of the show that Austin Butler and Caleb Turner have captured what it's like to rely upon your best friend in combat. And I feel like that's one of the, like the big selling points of the show. And of course, as I've already mentioned, the combat sequences are absolutely awe-inspiring. Maybe they're not quite as impressively staged as some of the dogfights in uh, Dunkirk. And obviously, you know, Christopher Nolan, he's in a class of his own. I feel like Kerry Fukunaga, he's got all the talent in the world. Maybe he hasn't had the same uh, opportunities, but goddamn, he's well on his way to proving that he could easily make a movie like Dunkirk if he wished to. And from what I saw in the teaser for episode three, it looked like the show might even get more hardcore than we've already seen it. And uh, I guess what I admire most about these combat sequences, is like when you're reading a book on history, like I, I love the book uh, Flyboys, which is a very intense, powerful, and, and in many ways traumatic reading experience about flyers who were shot down in Japan toward the end of World War II. And what they go through and the torture they experience is just uh, staggering. But if you're interested in reading a uh, history book about World War II and flyers, obviously on the other side of the planet from where this show takes place, Flyboys definitely will get the job done, but when you're reading history books, sometimes it's like it's like history under glass, and it keeps you at a at a safe distance. But when you're in the cockpit or you're in in the actual plane itself as it's getting torn apart, it just makes the experience much more visceral, much more terrifying. And as I was watching the show, I couldn't help but think about one of the all-time best novels of the uh, 20th century in American fiction, Catch 22 by Joseph Heller. If you enjoy kind of satirical dark comedies mixed with death and brutality and self-sacrifice, basically World War II and satire coming together, Catch-22 will absolutely blow your mind because it has all the grisly, gruesome details you could ever hope for in this kind of story. And the movie kind of was like Mike Nichols tried his best with uh, adapting the book into a movie. I think the movie, it's not quite as entertaining as something like MASH, which came out the year prior, but the book, oh my fucking God. Like if you need a little bit of comedy to help the medicine go down when you're reading about these experiences, Catch-22 will absolutely get the job done. And as I'm talking, I'm realizing maybe a good video to make between now and the end of this show would be a video about my top 10 favorite World War II shows and or movies because there's so many incredible movies out there like The Guns of Navarone where they're not trying to be like gritty, realistic, grounded World War II experiences. They're much more like men's adventure movies in the context of World War II. But there are obviously a lot of great, gritty, intense World War II movies out there. Like even like William Wellman with movies like The Story of G.I. Joe back in the 1940s, like seen through the eyes of the character played by Burgess Meredith. I mean, ever since World War II, even during World War II, I mean, some of the greatest propaganda films ever made, like Casablanca, it's not in like on the battlefield or up in the sky, but it is very much a World War II propaganda film. Maybe the best World War II propaganda film or movies like Air Force by Howard Hawks. If you love the sequences from the show uh, Masters of the Air, where they're just going through all their um, all their kind of industry jargon and like their, and their their checklists as they're going up into the air or coming down, there are a lot of great sequences in Air Force that are like that. Written by author William Faulkner, who was brought in to do some uh, some script doctoring on Air Force. So long story short, it's a huge topic. People devote their entire like entire lives to writing books about this subject or making documentaries or making feature films, and I think Masters of the Air. It's going to slide right into that overall um, kind of collection of great shows and movies on this topic. And one last bit of praise before I wrap this up. I don't think people should ever underestimate the, the value of and the power of a great title sequence in terms of setting the tone and the style and the emotion of what they're going for. Because the music... Is this. It'll send chills right down your neck and arms, and it's just incredibly inspiring. And some are going to say, oh, well, they're, they're trying too hard to be sentimental and whatnot. But the moment you start seeing comic, you realize this is not a sentimental show at all. Like it, it, Once you start seeing like faces quite literally being torn to pieces, it'll disabuse you of any notions that this is some sort of like sentimental, sad, and weepy show. It is gritty, and it's intense, but it's also incredibly inspiring. And when you're seeing these shots of the incredible cast that they've assembled for the show, combined with those awe-inspiring shots of all those bombers flying in formation, I saw the uh, the title sequence on YouTube like a month ago or two months ago. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, I get it. I get what they're going for. And if they can maintain this level of quality, well, then they've got a, a bona fide modern-day classic on their hands. So fingers crossed the show can sustain this level of quality. We have two more episodes by Fukunaga to look forward to. And then uh, he'll be passing the baton to other filmmakers, and we'll see what they do with the material. 
But I think I've said all I've got to say for now. I don't know if I'll be coming back to do weekly reviews. I mean, if I'm loving the show, I'll have no choice. I'll have to come back and do weekly reviews. But I'll definitely be back on March 15th to give a uh, an overall season review or season finale review. But I hope everybody out there is enjoying the show as much as I am. And if you haven't given it a shot yet, consider subscribing to Apple TV Plus because you not only get this, but you also get like Killers of the Flower Moon and you get Napoleon and obviously Argyle right around the corner. There's some good stuff being made over uh, over with uh, Apple TV Plus. And there's other shows like For All Mankind where I feel like if I've only seen season one, but if not for the fact that it's on Apple TV Plus, it probably would be the most popular science fiction show out there if it were on a sh- on a platform like uh, Netflix. So I'll be very I'm, I'm following Apple TV Plus and its development and evolution very carefully. But for right now, they seem to have a heavy emphasis on quality. And I totally approve, but that's all I've got to say for now. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking the video, subscribing to the channel, hitting that notification bell, but I hope everybody has a great weekend, but more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.